All right, yes, thank you very much for the uh, invitation to speak here. Uh, so I'll be talking about this notion of choiceless polynomial time and choiceless algorithms more generally. Um, so here's the outline for the talk. I'll begin by sort of motivating this notion and giving some informal examples of what I mean by choiceless algorithms. Um, and then I'll introduce this computational model of Blas, Gorevich, and Shela for computing, uh, for, you know, for choiceless computation on unordered structures. And um, I'll introduce this question of choiceless polynomial time, um, whether it e captures polynomial time on unordered graphs. And I'll present a group theoretic lower bound technique. Uh, so I'll show a lower bound that you can't choicelessly compute the dual space of a finite vector space um, efficiently. And finally, I'll discuss this uh, cipher Immerman problem. OK, so it's a, I'm going to be covering a lot of ground. I'll probably spend 10 minutes on each of these. Um, but yeah, feel free to interrupt me with, with questions. I know it will go by uh, quickly. OK, so, uh, so the motivation. Uh, so many natural problems that we study uh, you know, concern graphs or other uh, combinatorial structures with no inherent linear order. Um, so perfect matching problem, SD connectivity, clique. These are problems that talk about unordered graphs. Um, but standard computational models, such as Turing machines, circuits, automata, all deal with strings. So they take as input the encoding of a graph by a string, for instance, by the adjacency matrix. But uh, any encoding imposes a linear order. And traditional algorithms are free to exploit uh, the linear order, so long as the output of the algorithm doesn't depend on the order. <coughs> OK, so what's the problem with encodings? Well. Um, a single graph, an n-vertex graph, can have as, up to n factorial distinct encodings. And um, the problem of determining whether two encodings correspond to the same graph, this is the graph isomorphism problem, it's not yet known to be in polynomial time. Um, and moreover, the problem of determining whether a Turing machine is encoding invariant is undecidable by Rice's theorem. OK, so this motivates the notion of a choiceless algorithms. OK, so this choiceless model of computation introduced by Blas, Gorevitz, and Shela. So this is a model of computation that operates directly on unordered structures as opposed to on strings. It doesn't distinguish between isomorphic structures. And there are natural measures of time and space complexity that coincide with these notions for Turing machines if your structures happen to be linear, linearly ordered. Okay, and so the model will disallow arbitrary choices. So there's no notion of looking at like the first vertex in a graph. Um, but to compensate, the, the model will allow parallelism and arbitrary data structures. I'll, this will become clear what this means uh, later. And just a, a remark that any algorithm can be made choiceless in this model by first paying an n factorial overhead to construct all linear orders uh, on the input structure and then simulating a, a Turing machine. OK, so just uh, informally, uh, you know, here are some examples of choiceless and non-choiceless algorithms. So first, a non-example. So uh, a non-choiceless algorithm for determining whether a bipartite graph has a perfect matching, the, the greedy augmenting paths algorithm. All right, so here we just sort of greedily construct a maximal matching, um, maybe looking at, at vertices of the graph in order. OK, eventually we reach a maximal matching. Then we can look at the first unmatched vertex, you know, find a, uh, greedily find a path to an unmatched vertex on the other side, and uh, then swap out the edges and continue in this way until we get a perfect matching. OK, so this is clearly a non-choiceless algorithm. Uh, you know, we're relying on the, on the linear, li linear order heavily. OK, but there's a very nice choiceless algorithm for bipartite perfect matching, which I'm sure uh, Many of you have seen before. So this is a matrix scaling algorithm. So, uh, so the idea here, we look at the, uh, consider the uh, adjacency matrix of the graph. Now we just perform the following uh, row and uh, column and row scaling, roughly n squared times. First normalize the columns, divide each column by the column sum, then normalize rows. Repeat this uh, uh, n squared log n times. And then finally, we just check whether the sum of squares of the column sums minus 1 is less than 1 over n. If so, then we can conclude that a perfect matching exists. Otherwise, we can uh, declare there's no perfect matching. So in this example, the, the, you know, we get 0.22. Uh, so this is less than 1 fourth. So this tells us that there exists a 
perfect matching. It doesn't spit out uh, any particular matching, but it, we can conclude that one exists. All right, and this is a choiceless algorithm because we're not breaking symmetry at any stage, you know, we, assuming we can do these normalizations in parallel. Uh, a second example comes from uh, just considering the determinant of an unordered matrix. So by an unordered square matrix, uh, I simply mean a function m from s cross s to integers, where s is a finite index set, but with no, no order given. And just to mention, so the determinant of, of an unordered square matrix is well defined. I mean, one way to see this, if you pu put a, uh, any ordering on s and, and, and define the determinant with respect to that ordering, then changing that ordering, say, by transposing two elements, you flip the sign twice, once for the columns, once for the rows, so the determinant is well defined. Um, so the, uh, a non-choiceless algorithm, uh, the first one you learn for computing determinant via Gaussian elimination. This, of course, depends on having an ordering of the, uh, uh, of the rows and columns. Uh, but there's a very nice uh, choiceless algorithm. Uh, this is known as Sankey's algorithm. Uh, it shows that determinant is in NC2. And... Um, oh, it has no division of... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and um, so the idea is, well, all you need to do to, to compute the determinant is uh, compute powers of the matrix, so m, m squared up to m to the n, um, compute the trace of those powers, and then Newton's identities give an expression for the, for the determinant in terms of these numbers t1 to tn, okay? And this works over characteristic zero. There's a way also to make it work over finite fields by lifting to quotients of uh, polynomial rings over integers. Okay, and, and, and again, this is a choiceless algorithm. Unlike Gaussian elimination, we don't need to break symmetry. Okay, so let me now introduce the model, this blaskarevich shela model for computing choicelessly. Okay, so as I said, so, uh, we're gonna define BGS programs First, I'll define something, BGS logic and then BGS programs, okay? And these are going to operate on structures as opposed to strings. So what do I mean by a structure more formally? So, um, so a structure, uh, S, will, will consist of a, a finite set, A, together, uh, called the universe of the structure, together with some named constants, functions, and relations. Okay, so the structure in the sense you have encountered in, a, uh, in the context of first order logic. Um, and so, for example, a graph would be just a structure with a single binary edge relation. And throughout this talk, whenever I say structure, you can just think of graph. Okay. But relation, all these things are things you can access in your algorithm. Uh, yeah, that's right. So, so we're going to be viewing, right, so the input to the algorithm is going to be a structure. And yeah, these are the, you can talk about these functions, relations, and constants. Yeah. Ah, so the, the, so the states and the output of a BGS program uh, on given as input a structure S are going to live in the universe of hereditarily finite sets over A. So let me, uh, I'll have to uh, yeah, give a few slides on uh, basic set theory to explain what this is and, and explain the model to you. Okay, so now A is going to always be a, a so an arbitrary finite set whose elements we'll call atoms. And we'll think of the elements of A as objects which are not sets. Okay, this A is going to be the base set of the structure that we're, that we're given as input. These are graphs, these are the, this would be, A would be the vertices. The, A would be the vertices, right. Yep. So here are some examples of hereditarily finite objects over, over the set of atoms A. So that each, each element of A, the atoms, are hereditarily finite objects over A. Then you have sets of atoms. You have sets of either atoms or sets of atoms and, and so on. So for instance, uh, a set of this form is a hereditarily finite set. So more formally, um, this is, so we denote by HF of A, the hereditarily finite universe over A, is the union of the, is a countable union of V0, V1, V2, etc., where V0 is A and VK plus 1 is VK together with the power set of VK. Okay. So I also have to tell you, define for you what is the transitive closure of a hereditarily finite set. So a transitive closure of a set X, denoted closure of X, this is the minimum 
set which contains x as a subset and is transitive. So for every uh, z, which is an element of y, which belongs to the closure of x, then z belongs to the closure of x. So for example, the transitive closure of this set here, uh, yeah, looks like this. Okay, so this is transitive closure. So actually, from the example, I don't understand what the definition is because it was too fast. <laughs> ah, so, so, the, to, so the, to obtain the transitive closure of a set, you, 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 take, you take all the elements in the set, and then you take all elements of those elements, and, and so on. And just, yeah. So it's the smallest. So you take down everything. This is a, yeah, the downward closure, yeah. And you just list, list everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, good. OK, so. In, in the context of a graph, again, I mean, I just compare to this example. Will we ever need to take, uh, ah, we can take subsets of edges, for example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 OK, and um, since all the computation takes place in this hereditarily finite universe, let me describe to you how we, it, how we represent tuples and relations as hereditarily finite sets. So this, so this notation, this for ordered pair x y, so this this will denote the set x together with the set x y. So this is the uh, Kuratowski ordered pair uh, representation, yeah, and it's the set of the set of x, isn't it? The that th there there are a few different there are a few different w uh, there are a few different set theoretic versions of ordered pairs. This is one. It doesn't matter which one you take. Yeah. yeah. Um, and right, so we can using this we can define k-tuples, and then we can represent the Cartesian product of A as a hereditarily finite uh, set, just the set of tuples. Therefore, every k -re relation is also a hereditarily finite set. So, so are functions, uh, you know, a k -re function viewed as a k plus one every relation. Finally, a structure itself we can represent as an element of HF as of the hereditarily finite universe, simply as the tuple consisting of A, the constants, the functions, relations. Okay, so everything is, so, so yeah, so the inputs to the, to our, to our uh, BGS programs are going to simply be hereditarily finite objects. Okay, so next we have a copy of the natural numbers living inside the hereditarily finite universe in the standard way. So this, we just identify natural numbers with ordinals. So zero is the empty set, one is the set containing the empty set, Two is the set containing one and z zero and one and so on. Okay, good. And now we're going to consider sort of four primitive operations, sort of, sort of built-in functions on the hereditarily finite universe. And these are going to be these are going to be the sort of primitive operations of the of a BGS program. Okay, so these are pair, union, the unique, and cardinality. Okay, and these are just the following functions. So pair x y just uh, produces the unordered set x, y. Union of x is just the union of all sets y and x. The unique will, uh, so if, if x is a singleton containing y, then the unique produces y. So Sorry, can we go back to the union? Ah, yeah, uh, union. So x is uh, just uh, you know, some collection of, I mean, uh, collection of S elements which themselves may be sets or whatever. Yes. This is what you take the union of. Yes, exactly. So, so union x, you should read it as this. It's the union of, of all y over y and x. So the x, x is a... Y and x may be in different levels of... Uh, yeah, that's right. Have, uh, yeah, they don't need to be homogenous. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, this would, and if x is an atom, then this would just be the empty set. Yeah. And so the unique will, for a single tin containing y, it produces y, the element y. And otherwise, it will produce the empty set. And finally, card of x, cardinality, just produces the cardinality of x as an ordinal. OK, so these are our basic functions. Yeah, so, so, I so, it, so if x is a set, then this will produce the cardinality of x as an ordinal. Just the number of things that are separated by commas. Exactly, yeah. yeah. The number of elements of x. Yeah. The numbers are given by our first line. Yeah, that's right. That's what you mean by numbers. Yeah. yeah. Right. OK. All right, so now, uh, so this is sort of the main slide defining this BGS logic. But still going back to the same, since we are going yeah. to go back to graphs, to the previous slide. 
So the things we are uh, we are going to get from this is uh, we can take uh, possibly a, an element which uh, may be a set of edges which are themselves all the pairs and maybe a set of uh, it contains yep. maybe pairs and also vertices and uh, we can we can just split them all out, you know, separate them out or tell whether there is only one element in them. Yeah, we'll be able to do this. Okay. Yeah, using these uh, using these operations. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of these uh, not in the abstract but in, in graphs. So this is the kind of well, we can count the number of uh, elements in some. Sure, you could count the number of edges, or you could have some set that contains you know edges and vertices and sets of vertices and yeah. All right. So using these basic operations, we we now define a logic. Okay. So and. So this logic will have terms and formulas. So this is one big inductive definition of, of the sets of the syntax of this logic. So we ha we'll have terms and formulas. Um, and so it's defined the following way. So first of all, terms are going to be naming elements in the hereditarily finite universe, given, given a, an assignment of free variables to, uh, to elements of HFA. And formulas are going to evaluate to true or false under any variable assignment. This is what terms and formulas do. And so they're defined as follows. So and we have variable symbols in, our, in this logic. They, they are all terms. And then if we have terms t and t1, t2, then we can form terms pair t1, t2, union t, the unique t, card t. Uh, and, and then we have two types of terms which are known as comprehension terms. Okay, so these are the, these are the more powerful term constructs. So, here, t is a term, and phi is a formula, and v is a variable, uh, is a free variable of phi. So then we can form the term, the set of v and t, such that phi of v is true. That's how to read this. And then this comprehension term, so here we have... Where, where should phi be? Phi could be arbitrary. Phi is an arbitrary formula. An arbitrary formula. Yeah, for any formula and any term, we have a, a new term of this form. And then if I have terms t1 and t2 and a variable symbol v, then I can form this comprehension term. So this is, think of t1 as like a, a subroutine. So you apply t1 to all elements v and t2 and collect that into a That's set. A yeah, yeah, exactly. So when we th think of this as a computational model, these, these are sort of parallel, this is the parallelism, exactly. Right. Um, and then formulas we have, so the following basic formulas, you can test whether a term evaluates to an atom, to an element of, of the set of atoms A. You can test whether T is the empty set. You can test whether two terms evaluate to the same element of HFA. You can test whether T1 is an element of T2. And then we also have, you can form Boolean combinations of formulas. Okay, so this is the, this is the entire syntax of BGS logic. Yeah. This seems very powerful, right? It says the terms can have exponential length or potential. Yeah, they could have arbitrary length. And you can see whether they are equal or whether one contains the other in the Yeah, exactly. So, so there's going to be, you can think of a term almost as like a, uh, yeah, you can think of growing sequence of terms being like circuits, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a notion next of BGS programs, which is sort of you iterate a term. Uh, so that would be next, yeah? So it's the idea that we're, like, we're developing some finitary logic thing and then we're, and we're not assuming whatever the equivalent of the axiom of choice would be in the setting or something like that. Is yeah, that so it, yeah, it's a good question. So in particular, we don't there's no operation which, which will produce, which, you know, given a family of sets, will produce a, a set of canonical witnesses or something like so, that. I mean, there's no axiom of choice because everything's finite, right? But, but like, I'm, I'm asking why it's called choiceless. Like there's some equivalent of choice thing that you're not going to assume or something. Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, um, the equivalent of choice would be something which you, you could introduce a choice operator here, which would which would be you know in one in one step, yeah, producing a, a canonical witness of a set. But this would be breaking the symmetry, though. Right. Yeah, yeah. So let, just to build some intuition about this, so here I've copied the just. I mean, here's the inductive de definition of terms and formulas up here. And let's just see, just, just very quickly, just to get a feel what we can express in this logic. I mean, to build a singleton containing x, this is just pair xx. We can, of course, write out ordered, ordered pairs. We can express the union of two sets as the union of the, of the unordered pair xy. 
In, to, to pick the intersection of x and y, we can use a comprehension term. So the intersection of x and y is the set of all v and x, such that v is in y. We can take Cartesian product, again using, using comprehension term construct. Um, and we can test whether the, si you know, the size of x is less than the size of y, using this cardinality uh, operator. OK, some, and some more sophisticated things we can do. We can do bounded quantification. OK, so uh, to compute the formula for, um, for all v in t, phi of v is true. So we can express this by saying that the set of v in t such that not phi of v is empty. So there is no v in t such that not phi of v. Right? So we can do bounded comprehension. So we can test whether something is non empty, even if we cannot pick an element. That's right, yeah. So it remains kind of implicit, uh, the knowledge. Yes, yes. OK. And if, if uh, we can also um, have an if-then-else term. So if I want uh, uh, to compute if phi is true, then x else y. So this, to view this as a term, you could write it in the, in the following way. OK. You could say, so, so, so this set here will be the singleton containing x if phi is true uh, and empty otherwise. This will be the singleton containing y if phi is false and empty otherwise. So this will be a singleton containing x or y. And then we take the unique and it produces x or y. OK. So these are all things we can do just with individual terms. And go back to the first, sorry. Uh, for all v and t, the variable has to appear in t as one of the, the variable itself has to appear there as an object. The, you know, again, t is a term. Ah, yeah. So what does it mean, v in t? Yeah. Ah, good, good, yeah. So, uh, so t is a term, but it, so its value, so t will range over, um, I mean, the value that t takes will be an element of the hereditarily finite universe. v is, is just a variable symbol. It's not, it doesn't belong to the hereditarily finite universe. So this is just syntax. This is, um, yeah, so, so here, I mean, this is just syntax. V is not actually an element of T. But in, in the semantics of this, uh, of this formula, um, T will evaluate to an, to, a, to an element of HF of A, to a hereditarily finite object. Uh, and then, yeah, for each, for each yeah. So, so did, did I clarify? I don't, yeah, I don't understand what this operation does. Ah, OK. Yeah. Yeah, so, so um, but right, so here, so I haven't, I haven't formally defined what is the semantics of this. I'm, I'm just presenting the no, syntax. Give an example of, uh, you know, again, over graphs, what is a, a term and then without V, and then what does it mean at this particular? You know, just uh, an example of just with what this operation is, or what is lo uh, logical. Yeah, sure. So, okay. Um, so the so the the okay. So so the input to um, uh, so for for instance, we could have a term which evaluates to the set of edges. Okay, and um, you know, let let's say I want to say that there's uh, there's an isolated vertex in the graph. Uh, or, or, or let's say there's no isolated vertex in the graph, then I, I could say, um, okay, ra so rather, l suppose T is the set of vertices, is the set of vertices in the graph, right? I could say there's no isolated vertex by saying, you know, for every V in, in this T, which is naming the set of vertices, um, you know, then imagine this says there, there exists some edge incident to V. So this is uh, again parallelism. You can you can go over all the in this uh, hereditarily finite set. But anyway, it's a set of objects. Yeah. You just can uh, in parallel uh, search whether all of them have a particular property. Yeah, that's right. This is a, okay, that's very simple. I mean, this is just yeah, <laughs> yeah. Lots of symbols on the slide, but this is yeah. a very simple uh, meaning. Right? Yeah, yeah. This is a simple meaning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just to point out, I mean, it's, it's important we can only do bounded quantification. We can't quantify over the all hereditarily finite objects in this, in this model. Okay, so, but, uh, this, so this logic is, is not 
not uh, all powerful, however. So something you can't do with a single term is compute the power set operation. So there's no single term which applied to any, any x will produce the power set of x. And one way, a simple way to, 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 sh to see this is you, you can show the following. For any term with free variables v1 to vk, and then any assignment of x1 to xk to those variables, the, the size of t applied to x1 to xk is at most the size of the transitive closure of the set x1 to xk to some, to some power, where, some constant here, which is determined by the term alone. So in a single step, each, each term itself is, a, is a, like a polytime operation. Okay, so you can't compute something like the power set by a single term. So you can square, square matrix, so you can take the, yeah, you, could you cannot take the positive closure or raise it to a power n where n is the size of your set, which is done now. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. <coughs> yeah. Okay, so this brings us to BGS program. So in order to get a you know f fully um, you know a general notion of choiceless algorithm, all we'll do is we'll sort of iterate a, a term. So I mean, here's something you can do. So we're given as input a structure S, um, viewed as an element of HFA. And suppose we have a term T with a single free variable. So we can apply T iteratively to S, compute T of S, T of T of S, and so on, until some halting criterion is satisfied. So we have some formula phi, which is telling us when we should halt. And we can just keep applying a term until we're told to halt. This is a simple way of making a uh, you know, uh, viewing a term and formula as a program. Okay, so just to state it a bit more formally, so a BGS program pi will consist of the following. It, we have a term initial state, which given the, given the input structure produces the first state. Then we have a term next state. This is what we're going to be uh, uh, iteratively applying. Then a formula halt tells us when, when we should be halting. And then finally, a term or formula output. Okay? I mean, if, we're if it's a decision problem, output will be a formula, either true or false. Or for a function problem, it will be a term. Okay, so this is the notion of a BGS program. So V is the input. Yeah, V, v yeah, so, so, right. Here, V is the input for the initial state. Yeah. And <coughs> so to, to, what's the computation that this determines? So to run pi on an input S. So, so the, the run will be a, the sequence of states, a sequence of elements in HFA, um, where sigma 0 is just initial state of S, and sigma k plus 1 will be next state applied to sigma k. Okay? And you, you do this so long as halt sigma k is false. And then as soon as halt sigma k is true, the run terminates and it outputs, uh, you know, the output is output of sigma k. Okay, so I mean a run, just like with Turing machines, a run could go on forever, or it could terminate and with some output. All right, so this is this is the this is the the model. Now, how do we measure complexity of a run in this model? So we, let's say we have a finite run, sigma zero to sigma k. Well, then time will just be the number of steps in the run, so it will be k. And the right way to measure space in this model is to take the size of the transitive closure of the set of states. Uh, so, the, so for an element of the hereditarily finite universe, the, the way uh, sort of space complexity of that element, you, you should me measure it in terms of the size of the transitive closure. That's sort of the, the, how much space it takes to represent that as a, as a string, for instance. And it's not log of that. Uh, no, not, not log of the, yeah, so it doesn't correspond exactly to, to, the, to, the, to the amount, number of bits you need to represent it. But up to, up to polynomial factors, this will represent the. So it's a little bit weird here. I mean, I mean, shouldn't you, like, are the terms necessarily, like, monotone increasing? Like, could you replace this closure with, like, just closure of sigma k? Uh, yeah, they're not necessarily monotone increasing. Right. So why should you need to remember all of them? Why don't you just take the maximum? Um, yeah, you could, yeah, I mean, you, you, could, you could take the maximum, but you might be off by a factor. Of, yeah, okay, you, you, um, mm, like, yeah, okay, that's a good, I, I suppose you could, you could, no, but, but so, so sorry, so you're taking, you're taking this set of, so if you have a repeated state, 
right? Then it, it, this is we're taking the set of sigma zero to sigma k, so it won't it won't increase the it won't increase the space. Oh, okay. Yeah. But if we think of connectivity or the determinant algorithm, such the algorithm, is the complexity going to be polylog or? Ah, uh, okay. No, no, good question. Um, yeah, so here I'm, o I'm only interested in polynomial time and polynomial space. Ah, polynomial time. Yeah, this yeah. Will be, this will be not uh, 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 the, what we are used to think of just repeat and squaring in this model or this definition. It will be su super polynomial space as opposed to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th th yeah, it's very good. Don't yes. Ask about taking logs. You don't want to take logs. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't. Yeah. So here we don't take logs. Yeah, that's it's a good question. Yeah. So uh, only very recently there was a paper defining choiceless polynomial, choiceless logarithmic space. It hadn't been considered before, right? And so he and here I'm um, defining things in such a way that it's only yeah up to up to polynomial. Yeah. No, no. The, yeah, I understand the question now. Right. Um, okay. Good. All right, and so this lets us define now a complexity class, choiceless polynomial time. Okay, and this is the class of, pro of properties of structures, of classes of structures, um, which are decidable by a BGS program running in poly time and poly space. Okay, we, here we have to say both poly time and poly space. Um, the reason why is, I, so just as an aside, so the operation you know, the, the power set operation is computable in linear time and exponential space. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a simple exercise to show you can, can build the power set by, you know, say, start with the empty set and add, add elements one at a time. And so in, 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 in linear time, but exponential space, you can construct the power set. All right, so that's why we place both poly bounds on the time and the space. Okay. Logarithmic size subsets, which is what happens in the in the connectivity algorithm. Yeah. We give something super polynomial. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to be yeah you have to be clever to avoid those kind of blow ups. Right. Okay. So this is how we define. This is how the models define. All right. So something which is shown in the in the original paper. Um, well, every, anything you can do choicelessly, you can do. With you know, with the most poly blow up on a Turing machine, okay. So that is to say, you have a if you have a property of structures which is in choiceless polynomial time, then uh, it, this is decidable by a poly time Turing machine where the inputs are bit string encodings of structures, okay. And then the uh, so the sort of big open question here is whether choiceless polynomial time in fact equals p. So is it true that every polynomial time property of unordered structures, which is decidable in choiceless polynomial time. Uh, sorry, every, yeah, every, every property of structures in P is decided by a choiceless poly time algorithm. Okay, so this is the question I wanted to uh, sort of sell to you. So let me give a, a little bit of background on this question. So this is related to this question of, is there a logic for polynomial time in the sense of descriptive complexity theory? Um, so before choiceless polynomial time, people had studied a, um, uh, a weaker uh, logic known as fixed point logic with counting. Um, so this isn't the, the way it's usually defined, but you can define this in terms of BGS programs with a certain constraint. So, so fixed point logic with counting corresponds to the class of BGS programs, which have the following restriction that that um, there's some constant c such that for for any run of the of the program, the set of states um, form a chain of increasing c -ary relations. Okay, so, so if your BGS programs have this extra constraint, so this automatically means that it will run in poly time and poly space. Okay, so this is this is a subclass of choiceless polynomial time, and this is known as least fixed point logic with counting. So, th so the really, the, the way this is usually defined is in terms of first order logic with a fixed point operator and, and counting quantifiers, but uh, this is equivalent. So was that in the original paper, or was that uh, uh, Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know that anyone's made, th so this characterization I don't, wasn't, hasn't been m mentioned anywhere. But, but the, I mean, yeah, this containment was noted. Yeah, yeah that containment was. Yeah. Um, 
And if, if you've heard before of these, of these stable coloring algorithms for graph isomorphism, so what's known as the C-dimensional westphaler lehmann algorithm, it sort of corresponds in power to, to this logic, at least in the context of graph isomorphism. Okay. And so it had been an open question for a while whether fixed point with counting is equivalent to P. And uh, so, the, so it's known, so shown by Immerman and Vardy, that if on linearly ordered structures, so if your input structures happen to be linearly ordered, then fixed point with counting captures P. In fact, you don't even need the counting. Uh, there's been very nice recent work of Martin Graua showing that on any class of unordered structures which excludes a minor, that, that this logic captures P. Um, it's very, yeah, very nice work. He sort of redoes this uh, uh, Robertson Seymour graph minor theory in a sort of definable way in this logic. Okay, and uh, yeah, so it had been open whether this in fact captures P. And there's a very nice uh, work of uh, Cypher and Immerman which gives a counterexample. So give, they give a polynomial <coughs> time property, so actually a class of graph isomorphism instances. Um, which are computable in P, but, but not in fixed point with counting. And I, so I'll, I'll, at the end of the talk, I'll say a bit more about this. All right, and so in, in some work that I did a, a while ago with uh, uh, Anuj Dewar and David Rickerby, we show that this problem can be solved in choiceless polynomial time. So there's sort of a surprising choiceless algorithm for this problem. Okay, just by background. So I'll return to this later. So by now, so a lot of the recent work on choiceless polynomial time has mostly been giving surprising upper bounds, okay? So we've mentioned already that, that you, we can do um, determinant, rank, inverse for unordered matrices choicelessly. Uh, we, we saw the example for bipartite perfect matching from matrix scaling, this cipher Immerman problem, and... Uh, no, super logarithmic space. The Maybe part of disclosure, uh, I'm not sure how to think of these terms and the space they, uh, but, but basically you would say what you manipulate is, is this matrices and, uh, in your data structure. So without thinking about the logic, what you are actually keeping in your and all the data structure, this is matrices, and you don't really care about the naming of all the code. Yeah, that's right, so yeah. That's the way to think about... Uh, yeah, yeah, and, e and each, each matrix will, will have just, yeah, I mean, linear size, uh, yeah, yeah, linear space. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. right. Uh, and there's been some very nice recent work of, of the following authors showing that you can do linear programming choicelessly, um, and you know general perfect matching, um, and and some other problems. And in fact, for all of these problems, except the cipher Immerman, you can even do them in fixed point with counting. Okay. Um, and so it's uh, it's not even clear now what is a good candidates for separating P from choiceless polynomial time. And I'd be very interested if you you know to hear if if you have any suggestions for this. Okay. Good. So. Yeah, now in this part of the talk, I want to outline a low, uh, you know, I'm going to explain a lower bound to you, uh, a very simple one, uh, showing that in choiceless polynomial space, even you can't compute the dual, the dual of a finite vector space. Okay? And I mean, you may be familiar with the fact that there, you know, the dual of a finite vector space is isomorphic to the to V, but not canon there's no canonical isomorphism. In some sense, to compute the dual space, you need to choose a basis, and this is, this is ex you know, uh, expensive in the choiceless model. That's the intuition what here. Do you mean by computing so, so I'll, I'll say what I mean, but it, that there's no uh, poly space bounded BGS machine, which given a finite vector space as input, outputs the set of hyperplanes, say. And the input will be exponentially long. Um, right, but we're going to measure the size of the input in terms of the size of V. Right, so... so yeah, so I mean, by, since you're not given, you're not going to be given a base for V, or are you? No, you're given V. Yeah, you're yeah, given... You're given V, so V is an exponential size object. Uh, 
Right, but then we're but but in terms of the si right. So when I say poly space, I mean in terms of the size of the input. So if v is an n-dimensional vector space, then its size will be what you know two to the n. But then that the, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Yeah. How is this related to the question of p versus the choiceless? Yeah, good. I mean, so, so it, what this shows is that for the functional version of those classes, oh. it gives a separation. Okay. And then, okay. you know, what I've been on a quest to do for many, many, you know, since I was a graduate student is to cook up a decision problem based on this, you know, based on, you know, this observation or something related. So I'll, I'm going to sketch a, sort of the group theoretic uh, lower bound technique which shows this. And then you know, ask for your help in coming up so with a good decision. Function choiceless p is different. Yeah, from yeah, in some sense. Yeah, but the decision version we don't know. Okay, so okay, so let me. Uh, I'm going to outline the idea behind this lower bound. Okay, and so we're going to be considering uh, now group actions. So so I'll let G now be a permutation group um, on the set of atoms A, and so the action of G extends to HF of A in the obvious way. So if you to apply G to a set X, you just take G of every G of Y for all Y and X. Okay. So the for an, el an element X in HFA, the stabilizer of X is the subgroup denoted s stabilizer sub G of X. It's just the the set of uh, G elements little G such that G of X equals X. So the stabilizer of an element. And we'll say that an element x is g-invariant if the, the stabilizer equals g, or in other words, if g, g of x equals x for every g in the group. Okay. So here's, a, here's an observation. This is a simple observation that BGS terms preserve symmetry. Okay, so what I mean is, so if t, let t be a term with free variable v, then if x is g-invariant, then so is t of x. And more generally, for any element x, the stabilizer of t of x um, lies between the stabilizer of x and, and, and the group. Okay. And I mean, the proof of this is, is essentially just the following. I mean, it's, it's a simple proof of this by induction on terms. But for instance, the stabilizer of, a, of the pair t1, t2 contains the, the intersection of the stabilizers of t1, t2, and so on. So this is a simple induction on terms. Okay. Basically, you lose information when you apply that. Yeah, you can only lose information. And, yeah. Okay. So now I want to think of G as being the automorphism group of the of the input structure S. <coughs> and so now let's imagine that X is the output of a poly space bounded BGS program. Okay. So before I say, does the first one mm -hmm. automatically say if it's a graph that's given, it's really the permutation uh, group on the vertices. On the vertices. Because that's what yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. So now let's 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 suppose we have a poly space bounded BGS program pi, and I'll let x be the output. Um, so note that x is given by some term applied to s, a, a term of the form output of next state of next state of next state of initial state. Okay, so some some long term applied to s. So by the observation we just made. Um, Therefore, x is g invariant. The output is g invariant. Okay, and moreover, the, the transitive closure of x is also g invariant. So taking the transitive closure preserves um, g invariance. <coughs> now, since pi is poly space bounded, this, this implies that the, the, um, that the, the uh, size of the transitive closure of the output is, is at most the, the um, number of atoms to, to some power k for some constant k. So, uh, <coughs> so again, I, I an example. So in the case of connectivity of graph, it mm -hmm. is in choice of programming of time, right? Mm -hmm. The output is the, the transitive closure of the graph, but the connects components, basically. Sure. This is the... Uh, I see, okay. Yeah, and I mean, he, here I'm thinking, yeah, and here I'm thinking of it as a, f as a, f as a program which outputs, you know, the output is a term rather than a, yeah, yeah, but it could be the set of connected components, for instance. It would be a term, no, it's a, a set of connected components. 
Sure. Could be a, I mean, that's a, yeah. You can ask the decision problem, but you can even ask. I'm just trying to. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. The output is you miss blows up something when you look at the closure. Yeah. So so right. If it's the set of connected components, then right, it would be just. You know, the, the closure would, of course, contain all the all the ver the vertices, so all of the atoms, and all of the sets, which are connected components. Yeah, and then the set of the connected components. So it would just be a linear size, and the yeah. All right, and now he, so here's now a trivial observation we can make that for every y in the transitive closure of X, because the transitive closure is G invariant, this means that the orbit of y under under G is is, is, is a subset of the transitive closure. So therefore, by the, by the orbit stabilizer theorem, so the index of the stabilizer of y in, in, in G equals the size of the orbit, and it's at most a to the k. Okay? So the stabilizer has polynomial index in G. This is just a trivial observation. So what happens in this example, maybe, uh, yeah, just, uh, uh, yeah, I think that formally it's all uh, but I don't uh, try to relate it to something concrete. So what will this be uh, in the case uh, the time uh, computing the connex component of the graph? So what would y be? Y would be a single connex component, let's say. In the yeah, y could be, an, yeah, for instance, it could be a single connected component. And then, and then uh, the orbit of y would be just itself. What would be the orbit? I mean, it, it, it depends on what the automorphism group of the input graph was. So let's say, let's say the, I mean, for instance, in the, let's say the, there's an automorphism which, you know, mm, swaps two connected components or something like that, then, then both this, those components would be in the, in the transitive closure, right? That the orbit would contain those two components. I see. The, the orbit of the index. Yeah, I mean, so, so you can see the, I mean, the orbit will clearly have size at most number of vertices in this case. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this was a trivial observation, but what I want to mention is that, that it's, you can actually say something more about the stabilizer subgroups that show up here, this way. So what, what one can show is that for every y in the closure of the output, that the stabilizer of Y satisfies a stronger property of subgroups, which I'll call K constructability. Okay, so this is the observation which we use for, for this lower bound. So let me define the, the family of K constructible subgroups of G. All right, so here, here's the inductive definition of, of, of this family of subgroups. Okay, so we'll say that a subgroup H of G is K constructible if either, so, so the base case for this definition, the, st the stabilizer of an individual atom will be k-constructible for, for all atoms. And then if, if, um, if H has uh, index at most size of A to the k, so if H has small index, and it contains the intersection of two k-constructible subgroups, then it's k-constructible. Okay, so any, any, any subgroup that you can obtain in this way, starting from stabilizers of atoms, and then, and then you're able to, to you know, take pairwise intersections, and then any low index subgroup which contains those intersections is K constructible. Okay, so this is, this so is the. Be in graph again. So the, the base case would be just these permutations which fit which, the vertex. Yeah. And then uh, what can you construct with them this way? You can construct uh, subgroups which fix two elements. Yeah, yeah, very. Any constant. Yeah, 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 good. So, so right, so here, here's, here's an example along the lines of what Avi was saying. So, so I claim that for any k-tuple of atoms, the stabilizer of that k-tuple is k-constructible. And to see why, well, for, first note that, I mean, the, the index of the, of the stabilizer of a k-tuple has size, the, the, you know, the size is the size of the orbit. Uh, which is at most a to the k, so so it has low index, and the you know and it and it and the stabilizer of a k tuple equals the intersection of the stabilizers of a one to a k, and so using this you can show that this is k constructible. So moreover, um, any any subgroup H which contains the stabilizer of a k tuple of atoms is k constructible. Okay, 
So the K-constructible subgroups are a filter. They're upward, upward closed. Okay. All right, and now let's look at a, let's look at a specific uh, group now. Okay, so you could think of this, this would, like the empty graph would have you know, the symmetric group. Uh, well, okay, actually, so let's first look at the symmetric group acting on uh, 1 to n. If we're talking about graphs, it would be maybe, yeah. Uh, okay, so what I, what I claim is that not every uh, low index subgroup will be k-constructible. In fact, you can say precisely what are the k-constructible subgroups. They're going to be all h, which contain the stabilizer of, of uh, at most a k-tuple of atoms. So these are the only k-constructible groups in this, in this case, at least when n is at least 2k. All right? But what this shows is that the alternating group, okay, so the, the group of uh, even permutations, is not k-constructible. Even though it's an index 2 subgroup, it does not contain the stabilizer of, an, of a k-tuple of atoms for k less than maybe n minus 2. Okay. All right, and now this, this observation about Sn uh, generalizes, even the proof almost generalizes, to, to the group of symmetries of a vector space. So if V is an n-dimensional vector space over a finite field, and we look at the general linear group on V, so the group of automorphisms of V, then we have the same property now, that, every, that a subgroup H is k-constructible if and only if it contains the stabilizer of a k-tuple of atoms, okay? In particular, the point-wise stabilizer of a subspace of dimension at most k, all right? And what this shows is that the stabilizer of a hyperplane in V is not, which, which has, you know, a, a linear index is not k-constructible, okay? It doesn't contain the stabilizer, again, of any uh, k-tuple of atoms where k is less than, you know, n minus 2. All right, so this is the observation that we're going to use in a lower bound. All right, and so what I claim is that, what, what this shows is that no poly space bounded BGS program, um, given as input a finite vector space V, can produce the set of all hyperplanes in V. All right? And just to, just to sort of recap why, uh, so for contradiction, let's assume that the output is X is the set of hyperplanes in V. Then what we observed earlier is that the, for every Y in the closure of X, um, the stabilizer is k-constructible, okay? But we noted that the stabilizer of a hyperplane is not k-constructible. Okay, and so if X is the set of hyperplanes, then just consider any hyperplane in here, and the stabilizer would not be k-constructible, so we'd be getting a contradiction. Sure, but you're using much less of the closure. You just mean that an element is not uh, constructible. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's. This is not true in general. I mean, you couldn't use it to begin with. I mean, the definition even. Uh, so you, you you have an output to a program. Yeah. It's just you, you might. Yeah, I mean, you took the closure, which probably has uh, yeah. reasons. Yeah, I mean, it's, so it's a good question. Um, okay, so th there's something more you can say if you look at, so there's a notion of rank for hereditarily finite sets. So subsets of, sets of atoms of rank one, sets of sets of atoms of rank two, and so on. And you could define a notion of k-constructible for a given bounded rank, all right? And actually, this this you can you can mm, right, and so you can you can say more about that. For instance, you could get lower bounds for bounded rank BGS programs in this way, but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's just simpler to explain it in this way. I mean, yeah. So so what yeah what, what you said is a good a good observation that by looking at it seems stronger than the initial statement. I mean, this result. I mean, since you only need yeah. Yeah. And the hyperplane just an, an element of your output. Yeah. As opposed to something in the closure. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I guess I. Stronger. Yeah. Stronger. I mean, I stated it this way because so in the inductive proof that every every element in the transit in, in the closure of X is k constructible. Uh, I mean, the inductive proof of this uses the fact we have the induction hypothesis for everything in the transitive closure. So that's why I stated it this way. Yeah, but you're you're you're, you're right. We 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 only need. We, we only need this fact for elements y in x, yeah.
Okay, good. So, right, so on the other hand, this is, so this, this map from V to the set of hyperplanes, or if you will, V to the, to the dual space, this is a polynomial time, this is something you can compute in, you know, by a polytime Turing machine, right? If, you, if you're given some representation of V as a string, then you can use the linear order to choose a basis, which gives an inner product, which gives a way to construct the hyperplanes. Okay, so this example is, so, is showing that the function versions of choiceless p time and, and p are distinct, right? And yeah, so my, you know, the, the mission I'm on is to ha how to leverage this group theoretic technique to get lower bounds for a decision problem. All right, so yeah, so just in the, in the last, uh, yeah, last part here, I, I wanted to uh, say something. Yeah, yeah. no, 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 please. There were lots of questions, as you noticed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's great. <laughs> Ah, no, the best upper bound. No, in fact, you can... It's exponential. It's exponential, yeah. It's exponential. We know anything. Or does the low bound give some... Ex is the low bound an exponential low bound? Yes, it's an exponential lower bound, yeah. So, I mean, you can show the following thing. I mean, you could show that any, any BGS program which does output the set of hyperplanes, then you can show that at some point in the computation, so, for, so if you look at the transitive closure of all of the states, there's going to be some element whose stabilizer, um, in, whose stabilizer, uh, uh, if you look at the, uh, so you can define a notion of a, of a support of an element, be, so the smallest subspace of V, such that the pointwise stabilizer of that subspace is contained in the, in the stabilizer of the element. And you can show that you have to sort of have uh, a support of size between, say, n over 3 and, and 2n over 3. And then the lower bound is given by the number of orbits of such subspaces in, in V, which is exponential. Yeah. OK, so yeah, so I wanted to, to say something about this cipher Riemann problem, which is, which is with, and how this relates to this lower bound technique. So this lower bound technique, I've tried to apply it to variants of this problem and failed to. But I, yeah, I wanted to say something briefly about that. So I'll, I'll, I'll maybe go a bit quickly because I don't, I don't want to keep you from lunch. But um, so, uh, so I'll let G be the toroidal grid graph. Okay, so an n by n toroidal grid. Okay, and, um, and I'll, I'll let alpha be an assignment of vertices to 0, 0, 1. Okay. Now I'm going to define a structure based on, on, on this alpha. So I'll, this is the cipher Riemann structure S sub alpha. Okay. So it's going to have a set of atoms together with a single four area relation. And th so the atoms are going to be, we're, we're going to create, uh, for each edge in the grid, we'll create two atoms, E0 and E1. Okay. So the blue dots are the atoms of the structure. And we'll have a four area relation, which is encoding a parity constraint for each vertex V. So it's a parity constraint given by alpha of V. So for example, for this vertex V, if this alpha V is zero, then R sub alpha will contain um, the following four tuples. So it will contain, um, you know, the zero, 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 zero. So all, all four tuples you know, where the, where the B part sums to 0 mod 2. So in this case, it'll contain these eight four tuples, okay? And we'll have this, uh, f you know, for each vertex. So then we should think of a pair of uh, blue dots sitting next to an edge just as a value 0, 1 given to the edge. Yeah, you can make it 0, 1. But in the structure, right, so... Uh, in the structure, you want them to be out and out them, but in, the, yeah. in order to understand the constraint, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's exactly a site and form. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. And all we're doing is encoding site and formulas as a graph isomorphism instance. It's a bunch of linear equations. It's a bunch of linear equations. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And so the so the 
simple fact about these structures, the isomorphism type of these structures as alpha is determined by the parity of A. So the, 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 the sum of AV over all vertices V mod 2. This, this determines the isomorphism type of S alpha. Right? And so in this paper with Dewar and Rickerby, we give a choiceless polynomial time algorithm to determine the parity of A given S sub alpha as input. So this is something which you couldn't do, recall, in fixed point logic with counting. You can do it choicelessly. And this choiceless algorithm, it, it, as I mentioned before, that this notion of rank of hereditarily finite sets. So it constructs a sort of invariant of these structures, which is a, a hereditarily finite set of logarithmic rank. And we also, there's a lower bound in this paper showing you need logarithmic rank in order to solve this problem in, in, by BGS programs. So, yeah. Okay. So let me say, just make a comment about the automorphism group of this structure. So, so the observation is that for every even subgraph of the grid, okay, so for every subgraph of the grid where all vertices have degree, you know, have even degrees, so for instance, any cycle in the grid, this induces an automorphism of S alpha. You just flip all edge pairs, uh, you know, along, uh, you know, appearing in the subgraph. So this is the cycle, right. So in particular, if we ignore the symmetries of the grid, then the, the automorphism group is, is the cycle space of, of the toroidal grid. So this is just uh, some direct product of Z2. And this explains the failure of the lower bound technique here. Okay? In, in particular, and this, is, this, this fact is what we exploit in the choiceless algorithm, that, that this, automor this automorphism group has say one constructible subgroups that don't contain the stabilizer of any omega n tuple of atoms. This is a sort of downfall. <laughs> this is why we, the lower bound technique does not apply here. And this property of, a, of, of the automorphism group, in fact, applies to any abelian automorphism group. So if you want to apply this group theoretic lower bound technique, you, you have to have non-abelian automorphism groups. All right. and so, let me mention some generalizations of this problem that have been considered. So here, this is, you can think of this cipher Riemann problem I just presented as having coefficient group Z2. It makes sense to consider, for any abelian coefficient group gamma, you could consider some uh, version of the CFI problem where now alpha maps V to elements of gamma, and we get a, we get a, 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 a similar structure. Okay, this doesn't really change anything, and there's a generalization of, of our algorithm by this set of authors, which is solving this problem, and in fact, a generalization of this problem, the, the graph isomorphism problem for graphs with uh, bounded abelian color classes. Okay, so it's still an open problem to solve graph isomorphism for bounded degree graphs, um, or graphs with bounded color classes, but if you also have an abelian group action on all these classes, there's uh, a choiceless algorithm. Okay, so the, the last thing I wanted to mention is, um, so it's interesting to consider what happens if you have non-abelian coefficient group. And in particular, let's look at, a, we want to consider a centerless group, and so let's consider non-abelian simple coefficient group gamma. There's an interesting version of the cipher riemann structure that you can consider here. So we'll, we'll consider the, the following. So now we'll have, again, a copy of gamma at each edge. And we'll have a relation which consists of all four tuples, um, where now we're going to m m have the constraint that the product of the b1 to b4 equals 1, where you take this product clockwise around each vertex. How are you allowed to take this order? I mean, it's an order. So now it's. It's order the edges around every vertex. Ah, so, so good. So, yeah, so it's. it's um, um, so we don't care that there's an ordering. So, so all we care is that there's no order within these gammas. Yeah, you, you, by once you fix one vertex, you know, once you fix two vertices in the grid or three vertices in the grid, and then, but, but the point is that there's no order on these gamma. So really, these, you think of these not really as copies of the group as what's known as a gamma torsor. So there's no, there's, there's no base point in the group. It's just a, yeah. Okay, so, so, so here's a version of a, you know, uh, cipher Riemann structure with, with gamma. Now this structure has, many um, automorphisms. So you can show that for each face 
of the of the of the grid, and an, 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 an each inner automorphism of the group. So con you know conjugation, um, you can sort of conjugate. Uh, you can apply G to 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 the four edges in this face, and this gives an automorphism. And then you can also apply the outer automorphisms of gamma globally. So, so the automorphism group now looks like this. And this has a, good, a very good property uh, that every uh, poly, poly n index subgroup of the automorphism group contains the stabilizer of, of, a, of a log n tuple of atoms. And this, is good this would seem to be a good thing for the lower bound technique. It means that everything is you know, log n constructible. Okay, um, and is there you can you can get also uh, non-isomorphic structures which are locally isomorphic in any simply connected region by sort of twisting via an outer automorphism along any non-contractible cycle. Okay, so this is this is also a, a way to get two non-isomorphic structures which locally look isomorphic, but unfortunately you can distinguish these in choiceless polynomial time. And, but you know, the, the proof that you can do this, I mean, it uses the fact that every finite non-abelian simple group, that the outer automorphism group, you know, is generated by two elements. So it's non-trivial to show that you can distinguish these. And you know, this is as far as I got trying to think of, you know, candidate problems to separate choiceless polynomial time from polynomial time. Okay, so just to wrap up, the, just a summary of what, yeah, w what I covered in this talk. So what, I gave some in informal examples of choiceless algorithms, introduced the model, talked about this, this question of choiceless p time versus p, yeah, presented this group theoretic lower bound method and why it, why it fails on generalizations of this cipher Immerman problem. And then the open questions, you know, well, find a choiceless algorithm for your favorite polynomial time graph property. You know, or, or you, know, you know, let me know if you have a good candidate for a separation. So it's not even clear to me how you'd show that AC0 is contained in choiceless polynomial time. Um, or how you'd, you know, if you, even if you're looking at properties in NX, how, you know, to, to get a separation from choiceless polynomial time. And another interesting question that I don't think has been considered is whether randomness increases the power of this model. Okay. Uh, yeah, so th thank you for your attention.